There's a growing concern that the original philosophy may be slowly being diluted, if not completely lost, in order to make way for a new one, one which is far more welfareist in nature, where abolition is replaced with the reduction of suffering and improving the lives of those who will still only exist to be used or taken from. And those original values were never intended to be diluted or reduced. The idea of campaigning for better standards and more efficient forms of exploitation in the likes of welfare groups and legislation is essentially not only a complete lack of respect for our foundations, but more importantly for the victims that those foundations were set up to liberate, not continue to use in a nicer environment. Yet worryingly that seems to be an ever-growing view within the collective. Simply through the use of their language they use or the media they share, this reducitarian paradigm is sweeping in. The question I ask myself is, if I can live in a way that reduces animal suffering, why wouldn't I? Asking others to be as vegan as possible is also beneficial because it asks for reduction, which people are more receptive to than they are to full veganism. It's a relatively young movement. It's about food. I mean, there can be, like I said, a give and take, and that is what I call um, a symbiosis. We want to create a world which is more ethical and reduces animal suffering as far as is possible. I use the phrasing reduce suffering, and I guess that is the principle I align with more. I think that people are so concerned about suffering that they tend to lead activism into a welfare position. But can we please stop reducing veganism to a welfare movement where all we talk about is animal cruelty? We're not campaigning for comfier cages, and every time you talk about just cruelty, that's where people's heads go. Okay, so mm. that's the kind of o opening to it, and um, yes, it seems because one thing that that is pretty clear now is that cruelty is the dominant word with within the movement uh, right now. Yes, uh, closely followed by abuse, an abuser, and um, so so you know it's kind of interesting in, in the sense that if, even if you think about the official vegan definition where it says exploitation of and cruelty too. So cruelty cruelty is in that as well. Yes, yes. It is the second word, yes. not the first. Advocates will often reverse them. And uh, Andy Andy pointed out that, that you know, there was s s some streams when people are actually reading out, actually physically reading out the definition, and they still reverse it, even though it's right there in front of them, as it, as it were. Um, be because of this kind of dominance of the word and and as i said i think then it's caused confusion and i think this is why the modern day advocates often rail against an organization like the rspca but the irony there is the rspca are more in tune with the cultural understanding of those words than than vegans are and so there's a heck of a lot of work to do if you if you want to redefine these long standing understandings which we you know, we, we're socialized into them. You know, cultural speciesism, a big part of that is animal welfare ideology. And so even things like, for example, you know, teaching kids, uh, you know, don't be cruel. So wh whether it's the new puppy in the house or whether we're talking about uh, pulling uh, wings off flies and killing spiders, then often parents will say to children, uh, don't be cruel, you know, be, but but that's got nothing to do with veganism. And so this kind of link that vegans are trying to um, establish, we, we're going to have to accept that if we want to do that as a strategy, we've got a heck of a lot of work to do, which is you know, certainly not going to be done by calling people abusers as soon as they get confused by what we're saying. No. And then in terms of welfare, I always point out you know, Ed's book here, where he kind of talks about the red tractor and the paradox of the RSPCA. He, ma he mainly talks about these welfare issues and says, well, the, the red tractor is not working. Well, from an animal rights point of view, it wouldn't matter if, they, if it worked or not. He, he was on the TV arguing with a slaughterhouse owner, the percentage of times that the stunning was done properly. From the animal rights point of view, yeah, it, yeah. it doesn't matter. And, and then he put, a, he, he put like a cartoon out uh, about uh, this issue that he talks about in, of all things, a TED talk. A survey conducted by the British Cattle Veterinary Association, and it revealed that every single year, 
150,000 cows are sent to the slaughterhouse while pregnant. It went on to show that 40,000 of these pregnant dairy cows are in the late stages of pregnancy, meaning that the baby inside of them could well be capable of independent life. Now, there are no real legal guidelines to protect unborn calves, um, but the RSPCA, which is Britain's leading welfare organization, has a set of guidelines that advises slaughterhouses should follow in the event of a pregnant cow being sent to their slaughterhouse. And the guidelines are as follows. It says that the cow should be killed in the same way as she would normally, which is a bolt in yeah, so I'm just going to stop that and, and say this gets a little bit graphic, but not too bad. The head to stun her before she's hung up on the line and has a knife pulled across her throat so that she bleeds to death. However, they then state that the cow should be left on the bleeding line for at least five minutes to ensure that the baby inside of her has time to die as well. And so often what can happen is the mother cow will be cut open and the baby inside of her is still alive, breathing, conscious. And so the RSPCA. The Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals states that the humane way to kill a baby who has just been cut out of their dead mother is to shoot them with a bolt or hit them over the head with a blunt instrument. Their first and last experiences of life are on the floor of a slaughterhouse. This is from the blurb, this bit here, which is really interesting. So this is the blurb of the video. If you care about animals or consider yourself an animal lover, you owe it to the animals and yourself to go vegan. So that's where that's where they're making this connection between animal welfare, being an animal lover, straight to, to, to veganism, which culturally is kind of incoherent. And then for more information on how to reduce the animal cruelty, the thing that um, Andy highlighted in the film, you pay for uh, and to go vegan, go to howtogovegan.com. <laughs> which probably the person who organizes how to go vegan.com would be probably mortified if they knew that uh, Earthling Ed was uh, uh, was using their their website to promote uh, his kind of like version of welfare veganism. But when he says the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, as though that's meaningful from an animal rights point of view, it's not. No, no, um, because it was never meant to cover the cases that he kind of claims should be included within it. It was all was about like the kind of more extreme end of the ill treatment of other animals. It yeah, and about, also yeah. a selective group of other animals too. Yeah, and more to do with with animals like dogs and cats and. And, and and those animals, you know, animals that people consider as as pets in inverted commas. Okay, so the the way the way that this is getting constructed in in the modern uh, times, I'm going to show you a couple of very brief clips of street work that has been done by um, Cliff Grant in Belfast, Northern Ireland. This is where you get this situation that as soon as people don't agree with the vegan definition of things. They're they're an abuser. That's an animal abuse. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you think? Why, why is it? Why, uh, I'm completely against any form of animal abuse. Are like, you sure about that? Because ninety nine percent of people on this street tell me the same thing, and then they turn around and justify it after like a couple of questions. So, I, I normally ask you're, people. You're to, challenging me already. I am. Been, <laughs> in a friendly in a friendly way, but in, in a, a friendly, friendly way. But, way yeah, so, I, I normally ask people three. And, and I've been a vegan. No, I'm not a vegan anymore. No, See, there you I, go. I don't agree with. But abuse you told me you're against any... animal abuse, and then you're not vegan. That's why I'm here. Right. To turn. So how vegan. can you be against animal abuse and not be vegan? How does that make any oh, sense? Oh well, then obviously I'm for animal abuse. Okay. You are obviously. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you you fund it. Right, and so it seems seems to me that once you get to that difficult area, that's when you need to talk about culture, and you need to say, well, look. I understand that we're now talking about these words in a different way. Let's talk about that, right? So to, to, to actually just go for, well, you're an abuser at that stage seems to me not to have much of a, an a educational component to it. Another thing about it, Ronnie, uh, is it's very popular. That They get some lots of views and also uh, lots of comments. I just switched to to this for a second. Uh, the, these are uh, uh, some of the comments. First, first of all, there's a comment from non-vegan: eating other other animals is, is not abuse. 
It's called being part of the food chain. So again, that person is articulating the cultural understanding of, of that word, right? Which is not the vegan understanding of that word. And then yeah. somebody said, in theory, she's against animal abuse, but in practice, she endorses and supports it by being non-vegan. Now, that bit is putting together two elements which culturally don't fit because everybody is against animal abuse. You go, you, you go down your street and ask people, are you against animal abuse? Or ask them, are you against animal cruelty? And you can guarantee virtually everyone will say yes, right? Which, which is exactly what they do when Cliff asks them that question. And then he switches to slaughterhouses. And that's when they get confused because those words have got nothing to do with slaughterhouses and veganism. It's at that point that we need to be able to have a conversation where we explore the confusion between the two definitions, the kind of traditional cultural one, if you like, and the definition that the vegans are trying to, you know, they're trying to redefine it. This is the answer to that top question there. Um, eating, um, eating other animals is not a abuse. The response is usually this, stabbing animals in the neck is not abuse, right? And so, you know, question mark, question mark, okay. And so this is the attempt to redefine, but there's no discussion. We've got this construction now in the vegan community that there's a direct link between these welfare words, which are essentially RSPCA type words and veganism. If you make try and make this case, just, just as is made on the street, you run smack bang into the wall of cultural speciesism every single time because people don't know. Suddenly they're on board with you and then suddenly they don't know what you're talking about. And you don't explain the switch. You just use it to then say you're an abuser. The question for you, Ronnie, is that that is very popular in the movement, but it doesn't seem to be much to do with education to me but it's to do with clicks and you know a, a lot of comments thing things like um oh you know you showed her you exposed that person's hypocrisy you know all that kind of stuff that nobody's ever saying you know well, some people say when they get home they're gonna they're gonna think about it and and say oh i'm a hypocrite and everything i, I think it's 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 a sort of combative style isn't it um and, yeah, and but that's the really, hold, holding them to account, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I'd, I've had cases where I've been discussing veganism with someone and they've not and they've not agreed. And then sometime later, I've spoken to them again, they become vegan. It, it's because I I kind of didn't hold them to account. And so because they didn't go away from the conversation disliking me. It meant that they were able to carry on thinking about what I said afterwards, and and when they later on thought more about what I said, they came to the conclusion that I was actually right, and they became vegan. Um, now, if you if you create a situation where somebody dislikes you, if you accuse somebody of being an abuser and that kind of thing, they're very unlikely to to do that. A, a wall is going to be put up between uh, uh, you and them, and they're much less likely to rethink what you said. Um, yeah, and in well, fact, I, I agree that, with that. Yeah, yeah. In fact, in that conversation, kind of nothing was said about the reasons for for being vegan.